We'd like to welcome everyone to our Bible study this evening. Tonight we're going to attempt to finish the book of Colossians, chapter 3, and we're going to get into chapter 4. We, we have a, a lot of good information that we're going to discuss tonight. There might be some information that might be a little bit, you could say, uh, not typical. Uh, and you'll, you'll understand where I'm going with, with that statement as we get into our, our lesson tonight. Uh, but before we begin, we'll open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have to study your word. We know the Apostle truly had uh, wonderful information that he gave the church there in Colossae. Much of that was corresponded in, in, the, in the book of Ephesians. And, and those words that was given to the church are truly benefiting the church even still today. Your word is alive. We know that. We see that as we examine your word and we see that there's many similarities, if not even more application for us. Thank you, Father, for giving us this word. We ask, Father, for your Holy Spirit as we discern how it applies to us. And we ask, Father, that your spirit will indeed comfort us. Please, Father, let your spirit come and take all the frustrations, take all of the stresses, take all of the anxieties. Take all of the, the physical needs, Father, out of our minds and help us right now to just dwell on your word. We love you. We thank you. We give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. One thing I forgot to do with the phone tonight was to turn off the notifications. And so I apologize for all the dings that you may hear throughout our lesson. Um, but we're going to begin here with Colossians chapter 3. Four. Colossians chapter 3. three. And uh, we're going to read the end of chapter 3 and into chapter 4. Okay. Colossians chapter 3, look at verse number 22. Mm -hmm. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. We're going to stop there. What Paul is here basically telling the church is don't just please the master when the master is looking. Now, we commonly use this passage of scripture to refer to employment relations. Uh, an employment situation. When the boss is there, everyone has to look busy. Even if they don't have anything to do, they're, they're trying to look like they're busy because they don't want the boss to look and say, hey, you're not really that needed, so maybe I need to get rid of you and have less on the payroll. So when the boss is around, what is it commonly, uh, com what, what's the common thing for people to do? To look like they're busy, even if they have nothing to do. When the boss has gone out to do some banking or went out to play golf, there's no customers. A lot of times, what do employees do? They sit around, they talk, they eat in a, in a, like in a food environment, fast food. They may sit on the counter and shoot the breeze. Uh, they could be doing something else. In a restaurant, they could be cleaning the grill or looking for something out in the, in the, you know, in the, in the front to clean. They, you know, they could be uh, doing all kinds of things. Um, but this could happen in any kind of job where responsibility is given to a servant or an employee and they are expected to give an honest labor for their wage. And many times they only do so when there is an accountability. They they only do so when there is eye service. When they ask for it. 
when you know you're being watched, when you know you're being recorded, when you know that there's a camera watching you, then you put on this facade of, I'm a, a, a laborious person, I'm industrious. <laughs> but when there's no eyes on you, is that what you are? What Paul is saying is, even when there's no eyes on you, be industrious. Be out there doing something. You know, you're being paid. Let the the one paying you get their money's worth. That's basically what Paul is saying here. This brings up the, the whole issue of accountability in general. Now, let me ask you something. A Christian's accountability is to who? God. And that's a good thing. Because in the world, the only way to keep people well behaved is by a human structure of accountability. You put a manager on duty, you have him sitting there watching what all everybody's doing. That's a human structure of accountability. Or putting a, a camera up. Someone's watching that camera. Uh, that's a human structure of accountability. There are many Christians whose view is you must have a structure of accountability in the church. In your church. Unless, if you don't, if you don't have accountability, I've heard people, I've heard pastors say it, I've heard people well, well versed in the church say, if you don't have accountability, you'll, you will backslide. That's why they say you have to have a pastor that you're accountable to. If you're not accountable to an institutional body that somehow there's something missing in your Christian life. And you are somehow disobedient to God and you're probably not you're probably not just a loose cannon, but you're also probably doomed to black backslide or become a heretic. Have you ever heard those things before? Yeah. I've even heard this as a pastor myself. Because we have an independent church because we are a corporate that is independent, I, I've been told by, by, by people in other churches and I, even, uh, you know, others in, 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 in position that you need someone accountable to you yeah. if you're going to be successful. I don't have a body of bishops that I belong to or answer to. That's true. I, I don't have a, a, a group of men that live 3,000 miles away that sit around a table who make my decisions for me. That's very true. I don't have that. I do not belong to any institution by an institutional denomination. There's not a place like that, a structure of that, that, that governs me or holds me accountable. So people ask me, where is your accountability? Well, look, before I answer that, what does accountability mean? Accountability means that someone is watching you to make sure that you do not do anything wrong. Right. That's all it means. Yeah. I don't mind being asked, and I don't mind answering. My answer is my accountability is to the head of the church, right. Jesus Christ. Well, then they'll say, well, he's invisible. Isn't there any one human keeping you out of trouble? Well, my answer is, I'm actually, I'm accountable to him. And, and I think he's greater than any human out here who I should be accountable to. But also, I'm accountable to everybody in this church. I'm accountable to everyone who listens to me on Facebook. I'm accountable to anyone who, 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 who I encounter. You know why? Because. because I am public in my life. This ministry is public online and to the community that we are here. We're, we're transparent. I'm public in my opinions. If I, were to, if I were to start going into some type of heresy, guess what? Everybody would be the first to know it. Everybody would be the first to know it because I'm not secretive about how I feel or what I believe. I'm not secretive about my opinions. 
I am accountable to everyone. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Amen. Who kept Paul accountable? Think about it. Think about the book of Acts. To, to whom was Paul accountable? When you study the book of Acts, who was Paul accountable? The church of Antioch that sent him out, are those the ones that he was accountable to? Well, I'm going to tell you, he only visited there once every three years. So they couldn't have been very accountable to him. He didn't send an email back to them every week with an update. <laughs> For years at a time, he had no communication whatsoever with the, with the church in Antioch. When he went to Jerusalem, he did submit to James. But that was because he was in James' church. Paul was just a visitor there. But in Paul's life, there was no human structure of accountability. You know why? Because Paul said, every one of us will give an accountability to God. Think of the benefit of this. Paul is instructing here in what we're reading, servants, be accountable to God. Servants will naturally get lazier when they know that the master is not looking. Why? Because accountability is just human. They just serve with eye service as men pleasers. But he said, you serve as you are a servant of the Lord. And then he goes on to say in verse 23, Colossians 3, 23, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to man. Knowing from the Lord, you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will, will not, will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. He's not saying here that your master is going to repay you, because you can get away with stuff if your master's not looking. He said, you are serving Jesus Christ. You will be rewarded or punished according to your works, even if your master never knows what you did. You might be stealing from your master, and he might not know it. But there's someone else who does know it. Yeah, no. God does, and whoever does wrong, he may punish. By Jesus, the one whom we are accountable to. There are situations in life where we may have additional structures. In our job, where we work, uh, our marriage, there's structures of accountability in marriage. Even in the church, we just talked about a few moments ago, uh, there might be elders that you are accountable to. But the point is, I'd like to make here, is that accountability in Scripture is spiritual. It's not institutional. Let me say that again. Accountability, when it speaks of accountability in Scripture, that accountability is spiritual. It is not institutional. Paul did not have it. Let me ask you something. Who was Jesus accountable to? Who did Jesus report back to? Dead for all of us. Well, you may say uh, that that, okay, that's Jesus. That, that's not us. Mm -mm. The Bible says we're to walk as he walked, did it not? Mm -hmm. If he was accountable to God and not man, guess what? Okay. He didn't fall into sin and backslide, did he? Because he wasn't accountable to man. People who walk as Jesus walked will him. not backslide. Yeah. Even if they do not have human structures of accountability. Paul did not backslide. He did not have a human structure of accountability. The reason I'm harping on this is because a lot of people bring this up. Over 30 years ago, two very well-known uh, tele-evangelists failed. Swaggart and Baker, <coughs> both of them. It was a great embarrassment to the evangelical world. Evangelicals were scurrying to come up with some kind of explanation 
as to how this could have happened and how to avoid it happening in the future. I do not know if you remember when this happened and how strong you may have been in the church when this happened, but I was there. I remember it. Uh, reading Christian magazines and hearing the radio programs that was going on during that time. They kept on harping on more accountability. These people did not have enough ac accountability and that's why it happened to them. We need to be more accountable. Everyone was under pressure because they were saying if you don't have accountability, you might commit adultery. You might fall in the Lord. There was a church in Oregon who had an elder who was involved in the structure of accountability. He was very much a supporter of it and was very much into it. He was, uh, he regularly met with his fellow elders. But you know what? He committed sin right there in the local church. Even though he was accountable to man, he appears to have had two adulterous affairs going on in the church for eight years without anyone in the church knowing that it took place. His problem was not that he was not accountable to man. That's right. His problem was he acted as if he was not accountable to God. If he was, it would not have mattered if there were elders in his life or not. He would not have committed adultery because carnality is good when people are watching. Mm -hmm. But it behaves badly when people are not yeah. watching. Spirituality, though, on the other hand, <laughs> behaves whenever God is watching. And guess what? That's always. That's always for everything. When I had been told I should join a denomination so that I would have more accountability, <laughs> I've often told people, I call them critics, if I joined a, a denomination then no one would complain that I do not have adequate accountability, even if the presiding bishop or the archbishop don't, doesn't even know my name. Mm -hmm. But they would be satisfied that at least I would be accountable now. You are. But in what sense, if I was in some big mm -hmm. denomination, would I be accountable? only in a carnal institutional sense. Mm -hmm. I am part of a denomination that I'm I'm saying that that does not solve the problem, problem of carnality. It does not solve the problem of obedience. It does not solve the problem of someone not being holy. It does not in any sense provide the accountability that keeps people holy. And in organizations where all the members are technically accountable. They are full of members whose lives are lived in unbiblical ways. Mm -hmm. They spend their money, entertain themselves, conduct their family relationships in unbiblical ways. There is compromise, carnality, worldliness, sin, and all that among a group of people that are said to be accountable. Yet I know a great number of people in my life that may not be part of any structural accountable institution and yet they are ordering themselves in God's word they're presiding over the families in a righteous way they're not wasting God's money and entertaining themselves in carnal ways the people that I know who are living are living the holiest lives are the ones who are not in these so called structures that provide accountability because these structures do not provide accountability. They provide a sham and a pretense of accountability. Real accountability is in the conscience toward God. That's right. If a man is accountable to God in his conscience, he's going to live a holy life. Whether or not there's anyone watching. Whether or not there are persons to whom he defines himself as accountable to. But if a person is not accountable to God in their conscience, he can save all, uh, all the persons around him who are called the body in whom he's accountable to. And he can say that he's accountable even though he may still be living in sin secretly. <laughs> um, 
because they won't know and he does not care because he does not care about God holding him accountable. I've seen both. I've seen sin, secret, blatant disregard for God's laws by those who technically be called accountable because they're members of big churches. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a great deal more holiness among some people who are not connected in any sense to those churches or denominations. Gotcha. I'm not saying that there is no overlay. I'm not saying that there are no holy people in the big churches or denominations. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is that the evidence does not support the notion that human structure and accountability are somehow biblical or somehow necessary. Every Christian should live an honest, open, transparent life, living in the light, walking in the light, not concealing things in their life and living holy because God wants them to. And then the Christian becomes accountable to everyone they encounter. That's right. If they begin to slip, everyone knows that they're slipping because they have no secrets. It is not because there is somebody or some man who's ordained over them who will keep them from sinning. Horrible. If you think that someone can keep you from sinning, don't count on it. It doesn't happen. It's not happening. Look at the religious organizations that have the strongest authoritarian structure and you will find as much sin in the lives of the believers than you will find those living outside the church. That's a shame. It's not human eye service that keeps Christians on the straight and narrow. Mm -hmm. It's realizing that we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, we do. Servants obey their masters. Mm -hmm. And a good servant is honest. They do not rip off their masters. They work hard. That's right. Uh, they, they have a good conscience toward God. That's what Paul is here saying. This is the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. The non-Christian servant will work hard and diligently while the master is watching. An I servant or a man pleaser. The Christian servant, on the other hand, serves equally, faithfully, honestly. When the master is nowhere to be found... And when the master will never have any way of knowing what the servant did. Careful. Because, why? He has another master. A master in heaven who's watching him 24-7. It's a, rep a reproach to Christianity when Christians in a place of employment yeah. follow the pattern of the world taking longer coffee breaks, going to the bathroom more frequently than they need to, coming in late, leaving early, taking a day's wage without putting in a day's labor. In my mind, it's a reproach to Christ when the Christian on the job is not the most diligent worker on the team. Even if the other crew members are all sloughing, if a Christian is on the crew, that Christian should be working. If he is on the clock, he should be at the hammer, so to speak. Otherwise, guess what? He's robbing someone. The person who's paying him is assuming that they are exchanging a certain wage for a certain amount of work. That's right. If the wage is coming and the work is, it is not being done, and the work is not being done, at best, that it can be done for the glory of God, then the Christian is ripping someone off. And you know who he's mainly ripping off? God. Because they're serving the Lord yeah. as they are serving also their employer. <laughs> I do not think that servants and masters are exactly parallel to employers and employees. Because a servant is owned. A servant is a slave. The servant could not just leave employment like we can as a worker. If we do not like what your employer is doing or our employer is doing, what, what do we do? We try to go out and find another job. We can say goodbye and never see that employer again. Correct. But a slave, back in the Bible and even in modern times, they don't have that option. 
they are more like they're more like a child or a wife in the home, so to speak. And I'm not meaning that in a demeaning way, but we're talking about yeah. authority and structure and what the Bible has told us yeah. in regards to that. Yeah. A a slave in many respects is there for keeps. Yeah. Now the tri child can grow up and leave. But these people could not just change families. They could not just change homes. So the master is addressed just like husbands and fathers are. Now we're going to go to chapter 4. Yeah. And I'm going to insert something here. I thought I put it in my notes, but I evidently did not. Um, it's kind of odd. Chapter divisions in the scriptures are not ins inspired by God. That's something that man did. That's an innovation of man. Putting all this into chapter numbers and verse numbers was an innovation of man. That was not inspired by God. Mm -hmm. So when you're reading this and you're talking about the, what, the, the husband, uh, or you're talking about, uh, first of all, you're talking about the wife, the husband, the, the, fa the children and fathers. Now you're getting into servants, and then you're going into masters. But Masters is in a whole separate chapter. That may seem weird. Uh, I will admit that where they chose to divide the chapter here may not have been the most appropriate place to do that. But like I said, chapter division was not inspired by God. It just happens to be in chapter 4 that now we're going into Masters. Note what it said here. Chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. So basically it's saying, treat your servants the way that you want to be treated. Does yeah. that sound familiar? Yeah. The golden rule, right? Jesus said that concept on many occasions. He said what you, uh, what you measure out, it will be measured back to you in return. Remember that? He said, judge, lest not you be judged. In other words, the way you judge, expect that you will be judged the same way. He said, forgive, and it will be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. This thing about doing what you want others to do back to you is a common thread in Jesus' teachings. And, of course, we ultimately know that in the golden rule. Um, the same way. Don't condemn and it will not, and, and you will not be condemned. Jesus said all these things as a common thread. And of course, this is what Paul is telling masters to do the same thing. Give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. The whole idea of owning other people, masters and slaves, is repugnant in the culture that, that we live today. It's repugnant to what you would call cultural sensibilities. Very repugnant. Many people think it's so strange or even offensive that the Bible does not repudiate slavery. Why didn't Paul condemn it here? Why didn't he instruct? He instructed masters here to, to be just and fair. Why couldn't he have just simply instructed masters to release their slaves. Critics of the Bible will use this subject to attack the Bible. Now, I will make a categorical statement. Slavery has no place in the Christian church. But then, back in Bible days, it, slavery did have a place in the Christian church. In fact, there were times and there were places where the majority of the church were slaves. And the small minority were masters. Everyone who owned property owned servants. Slaves were simply part of an estate. In our culture, enlightened as we view ourselves to be, the idea of owning another person is repugnant. It's below any form of human dignity. But now there's some perverters. But we must realize ours is the first culture to come up with that idea. Ours is, a, is a, a new and a young culture. 
By the way, the fruit of our culture has not been so excellent. Uh, here in our culture, before we were in the, the ages that we're living in now, slavery was a thing of our culture, and slavery was not, was not good either. Slavery was accompanied by many abuses. But it is a common fact that when wicked people are given power, yeah. what do they tend to do? Become abusive. Yeah. That's true in marriage. It's true in children-parent relationships. It's very true in <laughs> government and citizen relationships. When wicked people achieve power, it is very true that they will become abusive with it. The institution itself, the institution of slavery in itself is not corrupt. But human nature is corrupt. Christians in these same institutions will not be abusive. In a society where every husband beats his wife, the Christian will not beat his wife. In a society where every man molests his children, a Christian man will not molest his children. In a society where every owner of slaves abuses their slaves, a Christian owner will not. It's a very radical thing for, for Paul to say, Masters, give your servants what is just and fair. That was radical. What he said was radical. Slaves have no rights. What are you talking about, Paul? Fair and just? Yet Paul tells them as such. Paul did not say release them because that may not be desirable even for some of the slaves. It may be hard for us to understand this, but in biblical times... And in most of history, some people preferred yeah. to be slaves. There were some who sold themselves into slavery because they could not manage their economic condition. It was very common in biblical times that a person who was full of debt and could not pay could sell themselves into slavery. If you think about it, if the master was fair and just and kind, the person had guaranteed housing, guaranteed food, water, clothing, transportation. A slave in a position like that, believe it or not, would be in as much more enviable position than a man today who has to work two or three minimum wage jobs and is still late for his rent. Mm -hmm. Because a Christian master was supposed to treat his servants well, mm -hmm. slavery would not necessarily have been a bad thing. Now, I'm not saying that we should reinstate slavery. Please don't get me wrong. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. What I'm saying here is that we should not assume that all slavery was universally wrong. If it was, if slavery was universally wrong, the Bible would have condemned it. Instead, the Bible regulates it. Just because there are many unhappy marriages, does that mean that we abolish marriage? No. The Bible does not abolish slavery. It does not abolish uh, uh, marriage. But rather, what does it do? It regulates it. Even in the Old Testament, in the law, the Bible made a provision that a slave could be released after seven years. But if the one wanted to stay a slave, the law said he could. Now, we can't imagine why someone would want to stay a slave. But there again, we were never in that culture. For many, it was for security. Even in America, here in America, we may not have the guarantee that a slave had, housing, food, medical care, guaranteed. But here in America, we do have our freedom. I personally would rather have my freedom than the security of someone else providing on my needs, all my needs, and taking my freedom away. People who are receiving all of those guaranteed needs don't realize that their freedom is chipped away. They don't realize it. But I would give up my freedom if that the only way that I could feed my family would be to be a slave. Mm -hmm. 
I would become a slave. I'd voluntarily become a slave if that was the only way that yeah. I knew my family could be fed. Sure. Many in America want to change the government to make the government the nanny and the master. I don't favor that in any mm. any any way. Now you may think by what I have reasoned that I'm in favor of slavery. I'm not in slavery in favor of it at all. I'm just defending why the Bible did not condemn it. That's what I'm doing here. There's nothing wrong with slavery morally as long as there is no abuse. Paul told the slave owners, treat them fairly and just. There were some slaves, even after the Emancipation Proclamation here in the United States, <laughs> after it was signed here in America, who, who did not want to leave their masters. Probably. Why? You think those were the slaves that were beat? No, they probably were, were all on the first train uh, 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 chugging along out, out, outside of the town. But they probably wanted to stay with their masters because they were staying with good Christian masters who never abused them. They must have been treated well. They were well fed, cared for, and had and, and their families, all of their families, their wife, their children were well taken care of. And that's why when that proclamation was signed, some of them chose to stay with their masters. Now there are many horror stories that we do well to be ashamed of. But we cannot presume that slavery was always a bane to people. For some, it was their ticket to financial security. Masters are to treat their slaves like people, not as property, but as people. Some think Paul did not speak against slavery because it would rock the boat with the Roman culture. I don't, I don't, I don't buy that because Christianity in itself rocked the boat. Paul wasn't afraid to go against the culture when he spoke vehemently against idolatry, which was a big part of the Roman culture. What Paul cared for was what he reflected, reflected the will of God. We have to say that although slavery was abolished in modern times by Christians who felt it was in, an immoral institution, and I will say that this part of the world is no doubt a better place because of that, slavery here is no longer tolerated. That's a good thing. But there are parts of the world that slavery is still being, you could say, in, in operation. In the better part of most of predominant Muslim countries, there are victims who are experiencing terrible abuse yeah. from their masters. And we can be thankful that here where we're at, we're not experiencing that <laughs> anymore. Where all men are not Christians, it is best that there be no slavery. Because there is a tendency without Christ to abuse power and make it corrupt. And that explains why uh, we had that here at one time in America. Slaves were abused because the people who were masters over them abused their power. And I would grant to say that it is because those masters did not truly have Christ. It seems that in Roman slaves, the majority of slaves were captured prisoners of war. Rather than being killed, they were made slaves. Well, there isn't anything immoral about preserving life. Some would rather be slaves than to be killed. You also have voluntary slaves who had sound, uh, them, sold themselves into slavery because they could not pay their debts. They would rather be slaves than to go to jail. Really, those were in a better position as slaves than, than their alternative. If the masters were kind and fair and just, yeah. it would be a very comfortable life for them. Not, yeah. not, I won't say very, but it would be a more comfortable life for them. I'll give you an example of a slave who led a very comfortable life. Do you remember in the Bible Joseph? Joseph, until he was accused by Potiphar's wife, was a slave who had a very comfortable position in Potiphar's house. He had liberty 
or I should say, he, he had some liberty. Uh, he had all the comforts that he wanted and needed, mm -hmm. and he had responsibility, but he did not have full freedom. Now notice what is said here in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2. Continue earnestly in prayer, being diligent in it with thanksgiving. I will say something that might seem weird to you. And it might even go against the grain of some things I may have said in my teachings before. Or in my preaching. But thanksgiving, believe it or not, is not a part of prayer. Did you know that? Thanksgiving is not a part of prayer. The Lord's Prayer, if you think about it, in the Lord's Prayer, it never had a line of thanksgiving. Did you catch that? Give us our bread, our daily bread. It didn't say thank you for the daily bread. There was never a line of thanksgiving in the Lord's Prayer. Now you may say that's weird. Why wouldn't Jesus put thanksgiving in the Lord's Prayer? Well, even the Bible said, in the, uh, I believe in the book of Psalms, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Where? In your mouth? It said enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart. It didn't say that you would be entering the gates, praising, uh, you know, thanking him verbally. It didn't say that. It said have it in your heart. Now, we are told in Scripture to pray with thanksgiving. But there again, prayer is one thing. Thanksgiving is another. And we are supposed to do both. Sometimes prayer is referred to in the entire complex of our relationship with God. And Christians have been taught that and told that. That prayer is it. That, that's the only way you really have full communion with God. It's through prayer. That's the only way. And, and you do all these things in prayer. Uh, it's the only way that, uh, you know, that, that, that you have that full communion. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever heard that prayer is a, is a two-way conversation with God? Yeah. Well, let me counter that. Prayer is not a two-way conversation. Prayer is a one-way conversation. Now, let me explain this. Okay. In prayer yeah. is where you lay out your petitions. Mm -hmm. In prayer is where you lay out your supplications. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by petitions and supplications? Does anybody your know wants. what the difference is? Yeah, your needs. Yeah, so, a petition is your is is your is your needs. Mm -hmm. Father, I need food. I need a job. I need money. I need. Mm -hmm. yeah. Father, I really would like right. to get a new car or a newer car because the one I have is about to go on the in the junkyard and I, I can't go anywhere. I need. Help. And I need that car for my job and to go to church and to do the things for my children. That mm -hmm. is. Petition. Correct. Supplicate is when you take something very specific and you just give it to God and you don't let go. Like the widow who knocked on the judge's door all night long needing something. She needed an answer for her son and she would not give up. That judge was sleeping hard and she didn't care if she made that judge mad or not. She just kept knocking and knocking and knocking until finally that judge answered the door and gave her what she needed. Mm -hmm. Remember that illustration Jesus gave? Mm -hmm. That's a supplication. Something specific. In our church right now, we as a body are specifically supplicating God for Pastor Jeff's condition and his, his situation. That's specific. Lord, <coughs> heal Pastor Jeff. Lord, yeah. guide the doctors. Lord, that is something. That's not just a general, Father, yeah. give specific. us our food. Give it, that's something specific. Mm -hmm. Same way with Sister Dixie. 
We've been supplicating God that her surgery is going to be successful, yes. that God's going to heal her, that everything's going to be okay. That is a supplication. And that's what prayer is. It's your petitions. It's your supplications. But honestly, the other two things that we normally do in prayer, praise and thanksgiving, by definition, that's not prayer. That's something we're giving God. And it doesn't have to be in a formal while we're praying and supplicating and, and, and petitioning. That's something we do God in our life, in our attitude. We're going into, I, I'm going to bed with, with such a joy in my heart and so thankful and grateful for what God has done. I don't have to formally say it. God knows that I'm grateful and thankful. And the fact that I'm telling everybody how grateful and thankful I am to God for what he's doing and what he did, that is thanksgiving. Same way with praising God. We praise God in the church mainly when we <laughs> pray, right? We can't, God. But some people say we praise him when we pray. Well, you can. You can do those things. But prayer is actually... When we're communicating with God, it's our side of the two-way communication. Mm -hmm. The one, it's our side of it where we're supplicating Him, we're petitioning Him. That is what is actually the definition of prayer. But we praise Him. Prayer is not a two-way conversation. Prayer is my part of the conversation. When I speak to God, that is prayer. When I speak to God, or when God speaks to me, guess what? That's something else. Mm -hmm. How many times in your Christian life do you actually hear from God the moment you speak? Mm -mm. I know in, the, in some of the Pentecostal churches that we've been taught that when you pray, then you're supposed to sit there five or ten or fifteen minutes afterward and wait for God to speak to you. And you're just sitting here waiting for God to speak. That's what that's what some of the churches, uh, the leaders, the denominations have taught is that prayer is a two-sided two thing. It's a two-way conversation. Prayer is not a two-sided conversation. Prayer is when you talk to God. And guess how, how often can you talk to God? 24 hours a day. In the... 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Paul said pray without ceasing. So if, if you want to pray like that, you go right ahead. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little humorous here. Between husbands and wives, when you're, are there times when the two of you are sit, sitting in the car riding and talking or times when you're maybe laying in the bed before you fall asleep and you're talking? And, or there's times when you're uh, having a conversation and it seems like there's one person doing more talking than the other. Now, that's not a bad thing. I think everyone should have the freedom to speak as much as they want to. If they, if they, wanna, they don't have that much to say or don't want to say too much, they don't have to. But you're still in a, in a, in a, in a, in a conversation, right? I think that's how it is with us and God. I think most of the time we're doing more talking to him and we're supposed to. We're told to, to pray without ceasing. We're talking to him. In fact, Smith Wigglesworth used to say, I don't ever pray longer than 20 minutes, but I never let 20 minutes go that I'm not saying a prayer. Mm -hmm. Throughout his day when he was awake, mm -hmm. he was praying. And when, if he prayed that much, I assume he probably even in his dreams was praying. Because it was a part of who he was. Mm -hmm. And that's that's okay. There's nothing wrong that we're talking to God more than he's talking to us. But let me let me let me encourage you here. Many people get discouraged because they don't hear God speak. And they think there's something wrong with my prayer life. Let me let me get this straight. Remember what I just said. Prayer is not God speaking to you. It's you speaking to God. So don't, don't miss, you know, misunderstand that if God's not speaking to you while you're praying, 
Don't, miss, don't, don't think that there's something wrong with your prayer life. You're still doing what you're supposed to do. You're supplicating. You're petitioning. Okay? Let me finish my thought. You're still, you know, you're still giving, you're, you're still doing your part. God will speak when he wants to. And it may not be anywhere near the time that you're praying. It might be when you're in the shower. Bam, he said so. And when he speaks, he's sovereign. He doesn't have to be told when he can speak. You know, it's not like the witchcraft people. You know, witchcraft people that do witchcraft, they have to set an environment to lure that spirit to come and speak to them or to communicate with them or to do whatever. And they're the ones setting the time and the frame for the, for the spirit to come. God ain't that way. He speaks, he is sovereign. He speaks when he wants to speak. And if we're trying to conjure something out of him, because I just prayed and I need a word from the Lord, and we're seeking to conjure something out of him, like the witchcraft people do, guess what? We might hear something, but there's a good chance it's not going to be God speaking to us. We need to let him speak when he's ready. And it might only, it might be like the, the quiet person in the conversation who the other person, my, sometimes in what our subjects between me and my wife, I'm sitting here talking for a whole hour and she might only say three sentences in the whole time. She doesn't have as much to say, but she's still in the conversation. And that's how God is with us. He, he's pray, we're praying to him. We're telling him our needs. We're telling him what we want. But the key is, we can still say, thank you, Lord, in our prayer. I'm not saying you can't do that. I'm just saying Thanksgiving is not, by definition, part of your prayer. It can be, but it's not. So if all you do is sit here and say, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, amen. Guess what? You really didn't pray. Because mm -mm. prayer is when we're supplicating and petitioning God. Just like we can have a whole prayer that's nothing but hallelujah, 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 amen. We didn't pray either. Because all we that was praise. Mm -hmm. We have to recognize that praise and thanksgiving are separate than prayer. But it's still something that we can connect the dots and put it together. Our whole disposition with praise and thanksgiving doesn't need to necessarily be in what we say, what comes out of our mouth. It needs to be in how we feel in our heart and how we feel in our attitude, how we feel in our spirit. That's where the thanksgiving and the praise comes from. And it will come out. And it won't necessarily be it, it. It won't necessarily always come out when we're talking to God, because that's when that's when we're petitioning and supplicating. It comes out whenever someone comes in here, sits down, and I'm ready to testify how good my God is. Now I'm praising Him. Now I'm thanking Him by my testimony. That's that's Thanksgiving. That's praise. And so, that is the difference. So don't get discouraged if you, in your, in your prayer time, doesn't seem to be hearing anything from God. Now, sometimes God will speak to you in your prayer. He sometimes will speak right then and there. But there again, He may not speak to you at that moment. You might pray about something and you're waiting for God to give you an answer and then the next week the a pastor or teacher might get up and God is speaking through them and God now has spoken to you. It may come that way. It may come that you hear that still small voice. Maybe you're laying there in the bed getting ready to go to sleep and all of a sudden you hear it. Or maybe you, you, you hear it when you're in the shower or, or you, you, you went to work you're in the middle of working and all of a sudden, bam, you hear God speak. He will speak when he wants to. He doesn't have to speak when you're speaking. 
So don't get discouraged if you feel like you're not having a two-way conversation with God. Just because he's not speaking to you when you speak to him doesn't mean that the conversation is still not going on. But prayer in itself is your part of that conversation. It's a one-way thing. The supplications, the petitions, that's going to God. That's prayer. And that's what prayer is. Okay? Did you have a question? Yes, I know that I, when I pray that I have a daughter that won't talk to me. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I said, okay, you know what? Will you, will you take care of her? Because I have to take good care of her the best I can. Right. And, and, uh, and that I, I'm going to give you her. So, uh, and then, then later on. I noticed that I, I'm reaching up there and I'm taking it back and I'm taking it back to us and I thought, oh no, I, I gave it to you, Lord. And and so sometimes I I do that mm -hmm. and and I'm truly sorry, Lord. I know you're doing a better job than me. But, you know, I miss her or I, I blah, 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 or something, you know, and, and I tell them what I have at that point. And so I confess again, you right. know, and and then I think, no, is that just my ego? Is that my, is that truly a prayer? Well, that's a petition. When it's you're asking petition. the Lord, that's part of petition. When you're asking the Lord to forgive you, yeah. Well, in that, in, in that, in that, not not like a confession. It's just in that circumstances, if there was something that I could have done better, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't, I did my best at the time, you know. Carol, and, I don't see anything wrong with, 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 with. And the I'm other thinking. thing is that, yes, Lord, I know you're on the tree, and I know that you died for all of us, all of us, even the ones you don't like. Right. And I am grateful that you've done that, and you're right. showing me. You're showing me that I still, I still want to be that as good as that. Mm -hmm. You know, right. it doesn't and mean that I have to like or dislike. Right. It means that this is the way you're showing me about how to act. Right. And, 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 and that's what, yeah, that's part of your petitioning. You're petitioning the Lord. Your your petitioning, yeah. you, it may even be part of your supplication if it's something specific yeah. about your personality or your or the actions or whatever. Yeah, but uh, you're that's grateful. all. Yeah, the forget asking the Lord to forgive you for a particular sin. Yeah. Yes, that's all part of prayer. But it's all part you're of great, prayer. I'm too grateful. Grateful. Right. I mean, isn't that thankful? Grateful. Yeah, it, thankful. Gratefulness. It's all. It all comes yeah. true. It, the thing about thinking that I'm grateful because I said thank you. No. Our words can I'm be a facade. On you're teaching how, me this. Right. Our words can simply be a facade. Yes. Just saying thank you. Yeah. Saying I'm grateful does not necessarily mean that we are. We have to, it has to stem from our heart. Yeah. And it's going to show and reveal in our attitude, in our spirit, in what we try to do, uh, in our interaction with others. It's going to show that it's coming from within. Yes. So it's not just words. No. It has to be something coming truly from within. And it may be that we don't have to say I'm grateful. I'm thankful. If it's coming from within, everybody around us will know that's a thankful person. That's a grateful person. That's an appreciative person. And they didn't even say that they were, but they knew it by the, 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 the disposition, the spirit that comes forth from them. They're going to know that. And that's what we're told. When we're told to be thankful, that doesn't mean we go around Everybody, oh, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. That That's not necessarily no, not what it means. When it says, when we're told to be thankful, it, it it's a part of our attitude. It's a part yeah. of our disposition is what we're told to be. And then that 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 will show in everywhere we go. People are going to know that's a person who really, really is grateful to the Lord. 
that person's really grateful and appreciative to the things that they have and what they do. It's going to show in our whole attitude. You know, it is a joy. There's a joy like when when I was told about the wells. Right. And and there's a joy in being able, right. even at this age, that I can help somebody right. have clean water. And, you know, that's, that's right. joyful. Right. Inside, you can't buy that feeling. Exactly. You and cannot. That, and, and, but that whole, that whole thing comes from, from our it. whole yeah. attitude and spirit. That's where it stems from. And if we don't have a grateful heart, if we don't have a, a thankful spirit, then we need to be supplicating the Lord to yes. change us, yes. to move in us, <coughs> to make a change. Yeah, yeah Lord, I, I said I confessed you, and I, I said that I followed you, and I, I, you know, but it may be we need to look in the mirror and say, is there a part of me that's not born again? Am I really, really in the spirit? Am I living in the spirit? Mm -hmm. And if I'm not, Lord, help me to be where I need to be. You know, that's what we have to do. Now, let's read uh, the next two verses. Okay. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought. To speak. Now, I think it's interesting if we go all the way back from the beginning of where we started Colossians, Colossians 1. In Colossians, Paul first of, talks about doctrine. Yes. Okay? After doctrine, he spoke about uh, making a change in our mind. Yes. Then he talked about lifestyle issues. Yes. The nitty gritties of the family life and all the other, mm -hmm. other nitty gritties. Then here he's talking about religion and prayer. And he's going to go talking further in just the next verse about our witness. I think what's interesting here is that Paul addresses our actions and the way we're supposed to carry ourselves before he talks about the religious stuff. The prayer, the, uh, the you know, the, the way that, well, what is it, the prayer, mm -hmm. the, the, the witness, mm -hmm. all that, that comes last. Yeah. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that when it comes to our whole Christian life, yeah. we need to get us worked on before we try to become religious. When I say religious, what am I talking about? Religious is, is not really a positive word today because a lot of people think that it's only a, a form of uh, yeah. a formalism, right? But, or traditional, just going by traditional stuff. The thing about it is we need to really work at being Christ-like first. Now, a lot of times it goes the other way around. People start coming to church. They start attending Bible study. They start, you know, pray, praying. And it's, it's like they're working on all the religious stuff first, but yet they still haven't worked on the, spiritual, the attitude, the, 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 the sins that they need to get rid of in their life, <laughs> the, the things that they're doing, the conduct, the actions, the behavior. <laughs> That's why you got people today who are very religious, but there it doesn't appear that they're really born again because mm -hmm. their behavior speaks a whole other language. When Paul addressed the church here, he talked about the attitudes, the behavior, and the conduct first. Get yourself right first. Once you're, you get yourself right, then everything else will fall into play. The prayer, the making a witness, the, the going out and, and, and being who you are as a, as a Christian. He showed the order that it should happen. Before a person comes to church on a regular basis and, and, and gets involved and connected into the, the church, 
They should have already done something here on the inside first. They should have already recognized, <coughs> I need to make a change. They're going to work on making that change. And once they see the changes being made, they're going to progress. That's, that's the order that it should happen. And that was the order here that Paul laid out. Now let's look at our last two verses we're going to talk about tonight. Walk in wisdom toward those who are on the outside, redeeming the time. That's a scripture that's also found in Ephesians. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know you ought to answer each one. Now, I could take a, 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 each one of those statements and make a sermon of it, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to key in on this verse 6. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. Now, when you say seasoned with salt, you could uh, be speaking here of purity, because salt preserves. Speaking pure things. That's what Paul said in Philippians. Uh, you know, uh, con con continue, whatever's chaste, consider it. Whatever's pure, consider it. Whatever's holy, consider it. And he, he went on further through a few other things, and he said... You know, whatever virtue there is, whatever praiseworthy there thing there is, continue considering these things. That could be salt. It, it's pure. You know, we're, we, what, what we say, what we do, what we think, it should be pure. But salt could also mean pliable. Now, I'm going to pick on Carol. Carol likes cream of wheat. And she'll eat it every morning. But, there's a caveat. She probably if, would not eat it too much longer if we, know, if we didn't put salt in it. Why? Salt makes it pliable. It makes it tastier. It enhances the taste. It brings out more out of the taste than the taste itself. Okay? And that's the case here with, with our words if we're making a witness of Christ, our words should be pliable. They should be catching. We should be able to say things that just really yeah. make people go, wow, yeah. I didn't think about that. Our, that the manner of, that we say it, our words, yeah. our speech, we shouldn't use ugly words. That's you know, right. the world here uses four-letter four adjectives. Some people use it in every sentence. To me, that just shows your ignorance. There's some beautiful words in the English language that you could use to describe things. Why use these ignorant words and, and, and offensive words? You know, use, use the, the language. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're encouraged to do in our, as Christians. Use the language. Use what we have to say in a way that people, if we're talking about Christ, do it in such a way that what we say is inviting, mm -hmm. pleasing. If we're sitting here using curse words and trying to talk about Jesus, that's oxymoron. Yes. That doesn't mix. That doesn't go together. No. So I think that's what he meant here. You know, either use pure words, the purity of salt, or make it pliable. Make it to where people want to be around you, want to hear what you have to say, because they know that what you're going to say at the end of it is going to upbuild them and make them a better person. That should be the goal, not of just every ministry leader, but that should be the goal of every Christian, because we're to let our light shine. People should know who we are, who we serve. And so that's where we're going to end tonight. We'll, we'll start off next week with Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. And I think by next week, guess what? what? We're going to be finished with the book of Colossians. Mm -hmm. So praise the Lord. Let's close with a word of prayer. Okay. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful and thankful uh, to have this study. We thank you for that. And we pray, Father, that you will give us a grateful disposition as we go forward to show that we truly are grateful, not just in words, but in the way we feel, the way we act, the, the, our emotions. People will know that we have what we have. 
we do supplicate you now, Father. We continue to pray for Dixie and Pastor Jeff. We continue to pray for Stan and many others who are sick and going through hardships. Mm -hmm. We continue to lift them up and pray, Father, that you will indeed bless them and give them uh, your, 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 your light, give them your peace. They need it, Father, and we so desperately pray, Father, that you will give it to them. We pray, Father, that you will continue to bless uh, Ann's family as uh, preparations are now being made for, for, for her memorial service. We do pray, Father, that you will indeed bless those arrangements, and we pray, Father, for your hand and your order in all of it. Continue, Father, to, to bless everyone who mourns. Mm -hmm. Bless everyone, Father, who is not feeling well and who are sick. Bless Sister Carol with her issues and Bless uh, many others, Father, who have their own personal issues, whether it's in body or mind. We mm -hmm. pray that you bless them. We pray, Father, for this ministry. Mm -hmm. Continue to use this ministry, Father, to educate yes. and to mm -hmm. give uh, inciting encouragement. And we pray, Father, that you will continue to use us in the way that you see fit. Yes, Mold us. Uh, enliven us, Father. Continue, Father, to shape us into what you want us to be. We love you. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.